Cheers. 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 Hmm. That is sort of an oaky afterbirth. Mm. What was that? There are many negative emotions that we as human beings can experience. Despair, rage, jealousy. But is there any emotion quite as uncomfortable as cringe? Embarrassment at the actions of others. We've all done something embarrassing at some point or another, and while it could be argued that the entire appeal of television shows like The Office is just laughing at the shameful actions of another person, many people report being unable to watch shows like that due to their pure distilled cringe. Even fans of The Office will likely tell you that there are some scenes that are just hard to watch. But while The Office is just one prominent media example, Surely we've all personally experienced cringe at some point in our lives, be it on social media or in real life. While posting cringe is a relatively new phenomenon, and several have suggested that we live in an age of cringe culture that thrives on the awkward actions of others, being cringe in public and cringing at others in public is far from new behavior and is as old as human society itself. While politicians and celebrities are frequently in the news for cringy behavior nowadays and cause their supporters or fans to wince at their actions, even that's not new, as Lyndon B. Johnson was reported to have liked telling people about his, um, Johnson, and frequently show it off, surely to the dismay and embarrassment of all around him, including one event when asked why the U.S. was at war with Vietnam, LBJ allegedly whipped it out to a reporter, pointed to it, and said, that's why. Okay, maybe that's not cringe, that's just hardcore chat energy. But just wait, because we'll get into some peak cringe as we go forward. We can certainly feel cringe not just for strangers, but our friends too, right? Maybe particularly our friends. Ever been around a friend who's had one too many? Why do we seemingly feel this pain at the embarrassment of others, and is secondhand embarrassment actually more uncomfortable than our own embarrassment? But before we go forward, if you're interested in learning new things like why cringe is uncomfortable, then you might be interested in completing or expanding upon your education, and you can do just that with this video's sponsor, Coursera. Coursera is an online learning platform that allows you to take your education or career to the next level with thousands of courses on subjects ranging from computer science to languages and, of course, my favorite, social science. More than 200 universities and companies, including major universities like Yale, Princeton, Duke, and Johns Hopkins, have partnered with Coursera to not just offer you useful courses, but real-world benefits in the form of everything from certificates to bachelor's and even master's degrees. If you're like me, you always want to learn more, and Coursera can help you take that love of learning and turn it into new options for success with professional certificates to make your resume shine. With everything that's going on in the world, a lot of us have had to put parts of our lives on hold, but with Coursera, you can continue to improve your resume or even earn your degree entirely online. So if you're looking to further your education or your career, consider checking out Coursera, so you too can learn useful skills or just more about psychology and communication. And speaking of which, let's get into the psychology of cringe. Cringe as a psychological phenomenon has been studied since the late 1980s, and likely became of interest due to the, um, unique fashion choices of the age, but was initially described by Miller 1987 as empathetic embarrassment. Much like pornography, embarrassment is something that we recognize when we see it, in the body language and facial expressions of others. Thus, whenever someone suffers the flustered discomfort of embarrassment, observers may recognize and empathetically come to share in the same flustered feeling, even though they themselves have not been embarrassed, because humans are social animals. Miller, in a first experiment, paired dyads of strangers together, and they were tasked with playing one of three guessing games either a cooperative, a competitive, or individual game. In the cooperative game, participants were asked to select the answer to questions such as, quote, would you rather go on a first date to the movies or to a party? But they didn't answer this question for themselves, but rather how they anticipated the other player would answer. If they guessed right, they would win a point for their team. In the competitive condition, subjects were told guessing correctly would only award him or her a point, while their opponent would win a point when he or she guessed correctly. Finally, in the individual condition, participants were asked these questions not in reference to their fellow participants, but rather in regards to the average student on campus, and were told they would win a point for how many of these questions that they answered correctly. Afterwards, a coin flip decided that one subject would be an actor and the other an observer. The observer then left the room, 
but could still see the actor through one-way glass and hear him or her through headphones. Next, the actor was given a set of cards that contained instructions regarding some embarrassing action that he or she was to perform, knowing they were being watched by the other subject, who was a complete stranger. These acts included dancing to music for 60 seconds, laughing for 30 seconds as if he or she had just heard a funny joke, singing the entire Star Spangled Banner with the lyrics provided, and the rock is this way. Uh -oh. or imitating a five-year-old throwing a temper tantrum to avoid going to bed for 30 seconds. I'm suffering already just thinking about the stimuli. <laughs> Observers were asked either to empathize with the actor or simply observe his or her actions, and further, the observer's galvanic skin response, that is, changes in the electrical conductivity of the skin, including sweating, were measured while bearing witness to this embarrassing display. Observers thought the actor was the most embarrassed when asked to be empathetic, when they had previously played the independent form of the game in which they neither competed against nor cooperated with the actor. In contrast, the actor was seen as the least embarrassed when simply being observed and similarly having played the independent game with them. The personal embarrassment felt in response to watching this cringe varied by participant sex. Men experienced the most empathetic embarrassment when asked to be empathetic after previously having played the independent game and the lowest levels of embarrassment when asked to be empathetic after having played the competitive game against the embarrassed actor. In turn, women experienced the most secondhand embarrassment when they were empathizing with the actor and had previously engaged in either the competitive or the cooperative game, and felt the least embarrassment when they were mere observers who had previously competed against the actor. In short, both men and women tend to feel more cringe when they are empathizing with another person, but women experience slightly more when they have directly interacted with others, while men feel slightly more when they have had little interpersonal interaction with a cringy person, when they've kept them at a distance. The strongest levels of galvanic skin response occurred in those asked to be empathetic who had also played the cooperative game with the actor, and the weakest response in observers who had played the independent game. This indicates that people who are being empathetic towards others are more likely to feel with them, not just emotionally, but physically, when that person is doing something cringy, and we may even sweat in response to this uncomfortable situation. Further, perceptions of the embarrassment of the actor was related to personal levels of embarrassment, as well as feelings of sorriness and sympathy, while only personal embarrassment was related to galvanic skin response. Taken together, experiencing cringe can actually make us sweaty. Mom spaghetti. Never forgetty. Stop! A second experiment predominantly replicated the first, but this time participants played a variation of the prisoner's dilemma game, called Beat the Bank, wherein it was explained that cooperation against the bank would help both players mutually earn the most reward, while competition would result in decreased rewards in turn. Participant Dianes were moved into separate rooms, and after making a series of decisions, again encouraged to be cooperative for their own and mutual benefit, were told that the other subject had either made cooperative choices 9 out of 10 times, or cooperative choices only 3 out of 10 times. In both cases, subjects were informed that this competitive choice resulted in the dyad failing to beat the bank. As in the previous experiment, a coin flip separated the dyad into actor and observer, and the actor performed the aforementioned embarrassing actions. In general, the embarrassment of the observers was less intense than that of the actors, as you might expect. However, subjects' susceptibility to embarrassment, that is, their general tendency towards embarrassment, influenced these results, in that observers who were uniquely more susceptible towards being embarrassed reported stronger reactions towards the behavior of the actor than those low in embarrassability. The more embarrassed the observers believed the actors to be, the more empathetic embarrassment they themselves experienced, but in a fascinating turn, observer reports of empathetic embarrassment were entirely not correlated with self-reports of embarrassment from the actors. Oftentimes, we feel more embarrassed for another person than that person feels for him or herself. Subjects higher in trait embarrassability expressed greater autonomic response, sweating more while watching the actor than those low in embarrassability. If you've ever seen someone do something cringy on the internet and felt ashamed for that person, there's a very real possibility that the embarrassment that you felt is not only entirely your own, but a feeling just not shared by the person posting cringe. Whether the actor had competed against or cooperated with the observer had no significant effect on these findings, indicating that we are equally as likely to experience vicarious embarrassment towards people that we have a reason to like or to dislike. 
Cringe, therefore, is not dependent on whether or not the cringy person has previously been cooperative. With that in mind, to further understand if friendship or familiarity with another person influences the effects of vicarious embarrassment, Chuck Roon and Nugier, 2011, conducted a series of experiments to further understand the effects of cringe originating from a stranger or from a friend. In their first experiment, French university students were asked to imagine meeting with a group of other students while on campus, one being French, one Swiss, and one Belgian. At some point during the conversation, either the Belgian or the French student was described as lighting up a cigarette, despite there being numerous no-smoking signs nearby. Subjects' levels of shame, embarrassment, and guilt were measured, and they were asked how they might respond to the smoker, if they would want to continue to associate with the smoker, if the behavior violated social norms, and how the behavior might make observers feel, either about the French or about the Belgians, and how that behavior might thereby change the opinions of observers towards the participant him or herself. Respondents were more concerned with how others might see themselves and the French in general when the smoker was French. The most commonly reported intended response to the smoker was shooting the student a disapproving look and a polite request for the smoker to stop. Subjects who were told the smoker was more similar to themselves, being French rather than Belgian, were more likely to report that he or she would intervene in some form. Subjects were more ashamed when the smoker was French, and greater reports of shame were related to increased propensity to intervene in the scenario. Shame was further related to concerns both for one's own self-image and the image of French people in general when the smoker was French. A second study replicated the same intergroup interaction conditions as the first, wherein a French student lit a cigarette around a group of international students. But this time, in the in-group condition, participants read that a fellow French student lit a cigarette in a no-smoking area in a group comprised entirely of French students only. Subjects were more concerned for their own self-image and the image of French people in general in the scenario wherein the smoker was in the presence of non-French students. 81% of subjects said that they would intervene against the smoker when the students around them were from other nations, compared to only 62% who would intervene in a group of all French students. Similarly, respondents reported more shame in the intergroup multinational context than in the in-group all French context, and those who felt shame were more likely to say that they would intervene. Moreover, those more concerned with the potential harm to their group or personal image were more likely to feel shame. That is, when we are concerned about our own impression management, we experience more shame at the inappropriate or embarrassing actions of someone who is more similar to us, and as a result, we are more likely to step in and tell that person who's similar to us to knock it off. It was not cake. It was cringe, father. And cut it out. In their final study, the researchers were interested in the influence of stereotypes on vicarious shame and embarrassment. The procedure was identical to the first study, but before answering questions about the event, some subjects read a news article about perceptions of the French from other Europeans, in which the French were described as a disrespectful, arrogant, and dirty people. This is verbal abuse. Those who read the article about French stereotypes were more concerned with negative perceptions about the French, when they were also more concerned with how the smoker's behavior might damage their personal or group identity. Guilt, rather than shame, mediated the relationship between the stereotyping article and intentions to intervene against the smoker. As such, we might expect that our degrees of secondhand embarrassment would be affected by how much we know or like someone who is being cringy, which was examined by Stocks et al. 2011. In their first experiment, subjects were recruited supposedly by their university to read reports and listen to audio diaries from students to help develop strategies for transition between high school life and university life. First, subjects read a description of a fellow student, Zach, which manipulated how much students would like him. In the liking condition, Zach was described as helping an old, confused woman find her house and carrying her groceries home for her. In the disliking condition, Zach refused to help the old woman, was rude to her, and was responsible for her falling over and dropping her groceries, telling her that she got what she deserved for bothering him. So, a real douchebag. Participants then read a transcript and listened to audio of Zach describing a particularly bad day. He slept in, missed his first class, and later went on a date arranged by his friends with an attractive woman named Sarah. While on their date, Zach laughed so hard at one of her jokes that he shot soda out of his nose and then while laughing, and I quote, ripped a big one and it smelled really bad and we both know who did it. 
idiot. Ah. Ah. Ooh. Whoa. This vicarious embarrassment stuff is going to vicariously kill me, I swear to God. And by the way, this is the true danger of women trying to be funny. Respondents liked Zack less when he was cruel to the old woman, cared less about Zack's welfare, were less distressed by the story, and felt both less empathetic concern for Zack as well as less empathetic embarrassment for him compared to when Zack was a likable figure who helped out the old woman. Thus, we can perceive the same embarrassing event differently based on how much we like a cringy person and are more empathetic towards someone who has done something embarrassing when we think that person is more likable. A second experiment replicated the first, but this time some participants were asked to be objective, some were asked to try and put themselves into Zack's position during the awkward date story, and a third group was asked to try and empathize with Zack. Afterwards, subjects were asked if he or she would like to receive update emails about Zack's welfare and college transition over the next six weeks. Those asked to put themselves in Zack's shoes reported more feelings of personal distress in response to the date story, as well as more empathetic embarrassment. In turn, those asked to empathize with Zack reported more empathetic concern for him. Those asked to be objective or to take Zack's perspective were equally as likely to ask to be updated about Zack's condition, while those who were asked to be empathetic towards Zack were twice as likely to request updates. Simply trying to think about how someone else might feel during an embarrassing situation then increases our capacity for vicarious embarrassment, while imagining ourselves as the embarrassed person simply increases feelings of personal distress. While we can feel embarrassed for someone, trying to feel embarrassment with someone just makes us uncomfortable too. I would really prefer if you would be quiet. <laughs> but yes, you are correct. Secondhand embarrassment at the actions of people that we like or are friends with is not just something that we can measure with social science instruments. It's something that people recognize and will tell you in their own words, as seen in a qualitative analysis from Killian, Steinman, and Hames, 2017, involving customer interactions in retail environments, potentially the cringiest of all environments. I want sexual sauce. Where's my sexual sauce? Subjects read an example of an embarrassing customer interaction at a doctor's office, wherein one woman needed a prescription, and then when the employee was not able to help this woman immediately, she became upset and started to argue with the employee, which made another woman who was in the office feel vicariously embarrassed for her. I think we've all been there. Subjects were then asked to recall a similar event that he or she had experienced within his or her own life, while several recalled events involving strangers, such as a rude and impatient girl in the school cafeteria, multiple respondents noted that having a relationship with the person acting embarrassing as particularly awkward, with one stating, quote, If the person is a total stranger, then I'll just observe and think, oh my god, turn around and go. Perhaps, uh, I think about the situation. But if it is a friend, or someone I know, then I will say something, or even try to resolve the situation, somehow. Because it is somehow linked to me." Subjects further noted that he or she might be more likely to intervene due to this friendship affiliation, with another stating, quote, "...to say to strangers they have no manners is difficult, but if that guy is an acquaintance or a friend, you can say something. With strangers it's more difficult because you can easily make a mistake in how you react, and then you are the embarrassing person." While these participants were describing friends and acquaintances, some described the actions of their family, with a mother commenting on how she feels when her children misbehave in stores, saying, quote, I feel embarrassed because I feel as though I didn't bring them up properly. At the grocery store in front of the registers, if the children see something they want to have and then they don't stop, then I feel embarrassed. Clearly, we recognize then that when our friends or family are doing something cringy, it potentially reflects poorly upon ourselves, which in turn manifests as vicarious embarrassment. Look at that guy just like a hot dog, mommy. Let that inspire you to stay in school, Billy. Another qualitative analysis from a student research presentation conducted by German et al. 2019 found similar results in student stories related to the classroom environment. Subjects were asked to recall a situation wherein another student did something cringy, and were asked how they felt during this event, as well as what actions they would take in response to it. They broke down the stories shared into three types, criticism, awkward acts, and forgetfulness. Criticism stories, the most common, included instances where any student's grades were disparaged by a professor in front of the class, or a professor asking a student about his parents, only to find out that the student was an orphan. Oof. 
Finally, the least common type, forgetful stories, included an instance wherein a student forgot what to say during a public speaking class, or absolutely horrifyingly, a professor leaving her lavalier mic on while going to the bathroom during a lecture, so the whole class got to hear her go. 39% of respondents reported feeling empathy for those in these situations, the most commonly reported emotion, followed by shock, anger, and awkwardness. It's not a radical idea, then, to suggest that because we feel more secondhand embarrassment at the behaviors of those with whom we are associated with, that a politician or group leader who is seen as doing embarrassing things would elicit a form of vicarious shame on the part of members of an entire political party. And love him or hate him, Trump has sure done some embarrassing things, particularly on Twitter. Thus, Paul et al. 2019 examined the use of the term embarrassment from US-based Twitter accounts over time and related this use to major scandals or events concerning Donald Trump, and found that, as you might expect, when Trump did something heavily criticized, the use of the word embarrassed majorly increased on the social media website. The researchers tracked the use of the word embarrassment over time on Twitter between 2015, under the Obama administration, through August 2017, well into the Trump administration, and found a 45% increase in the total usage of the term embarrassment between the 2016 debates and the end of data collection. Embarrassment peaked during the 2016 presidential debates, when Trump refused to shake hands with Angela Merkel, and when Trump pushed Montenegro Prime Minister Dusko Markovic out of the way during a 2017 NATO summit. Specifically, during the peak days of embarrassment, tweets explicitly including the word Trump comprised between 20 and 35% of all embarrassment-related messages. Now, while it's completely reasonable to assume that these mentions of embarrassment came primarily from the left, if, instead, as we have seen that we tend to be more embarrassed by those within our own in-group, it may be that these expressions of embarrassment arose more from conservatives or Trump supporters than from Democrats. However, considering that the peak embarrassment events occurred during international faux pas, it may be that this embarrassment was a result of shared identity as Americans rather than any specific party or political affiliation. An American football team kneeling for the Star Spangled Banner while standing for God Save the Queen is perhaps a perfect exemplar of political group-based embarrassment, for example. That, that hurt my feelings. That hurt my feelings. You're supposed to be this positive person. Can't we just talk about things we like? Since we've seen that empathy and affiliation both play a role in vicarious embarrassment, so too then should perspective taking, or imagining how we would feel in another person's shoes or situation, which was examined by Hawk, Fisher, and Van Cleef 2011. In their first study, female Dutch participants were paired into dyads, much as with Miller's study. However, the other supposed participant was really just a research assistant confederate. No, still not that type of confederate. After the confederate was artificially chosen as the actor in the experiment, she left the room and subjects watched a pre-recorded video, supposedly a live feed of the confederate dancing in the other room. In the embarrassed condition, the confederate displayed physical signs of shame or awkwardness, including gaze aversion, smiling, touching her face, hair, and clothing, and downward head movements. While in the non-embarrassed condition, the confederate remained cool and aloof while dancing. Respondents then reported on their own emotions regarding the video and were asked to evaluate it as objectively as possible, the objective condition, while those in the perspective-taking condition were asked to report on the emotions of the confederate dancer. Participants felt that the dancer was more embarrassed when she showed physical signs or symbols of awkwardness, but those asked to think about the feelings of the dancer reported more sensations of embarrassment, regardless of whether or not she looked physically uncomfortable. Thus, people can feel more embarrassed when they imagine themselves in the position of someone doing something embarrassing, similarly to how they do when they view themselves as part of a shared social group when someone in that group is violating social norms. A second study sought to identify emotional contagion and mimicry by examining the body language of subjects exposed to an embarrassed person. Subjects were placed in a cubicle in front of a computer with a webcam. Subjects watched the video of the dancing woman from the previous experiment, and their body language was, unbeknownst to them, recorded via webcam as they watched. They then reported on their feelings of empathetic embarrassment for the dancer and their degree of perspective taking with her. Under the auspices of studying rhythm, participants were then asked to dance along or sing along with a song with which he or she was unfamiliar. At this point, they were told that the webcam would record their actions. Those who watched the awkward version of the video of the girl dancing expressed more empathetic embarrassment than those who watched the non-awkward version. While there was generally no such effect for those asked to sing between the embarrassed or non-embarrassed Confederate videos. 
Relatedly, those who were asked to dance were more able to take the perspective of the woman in the film. Whether subjects danced or sang, they were more likely to mimic awkward body language when the woman dancing looked uncomfortable. Have you ever watched some cringy thing online and found yourself averting your eyes or wincing? Well, these data would indicate that this is a physical reaction that we experience when a cringy person seems ashamed him or herself, and as a byproduct, increases our own experience of empathetic embarrassment. For the same reason, I can pick up this pencil, tell you its name is Steve, and go like this. Oh. And part of you dies, just a little bit on the inside, because people can connect with anything. Because embarrassment is such an uncomfortable emotion, why do we feel it in the first place? And perhaps more importantly, why do we feel embarrassment for others when we haven't done anything shameful ourselves? Well, Irving Goffman proposed that embarrassment is not just a social emotion, but a pro-social emotion. Specifically, Goffman 1956 early analysis of embarrassment hypothesized that embarrassment signals an individual's underlying pro-sociality and trustworthiness. To test this hypothesis, Feinberg, Willer, and Keltner 2012 conducted a series of experiments to identify the relationship between displays of embarrassment and perceptions of trust. In a preliminary study, students were asked to record a short video describing a time when he or she was embarrassed, such as tripping and falling over or passing gas in public, for use in subsequent experiments. So the stimuli in this research were not actors playing a role, but real embarrassing stories from real people. In their first experiment, subjects watched these embarrassing videos and were asked about the embarrassment they felt towards them, as well as their general levels of embarrassability. And then, their degrees of prosociality were assessed using a measure of altruism and generosity via a dictator game. In this version of the dictator game, participants were allocated 10 raffle tickets, each worth one entry into a drawing for a $50 gift certificate, and were told they could divide these tickets between themselves and another person. Participants who reported more embarrassability were more likely to be generous and to report higher levels of altruism. In a second study, the researchers selected an example of a very embarrassing story and a minimally embarrassing story from the aforementioned stimuli, and asked participants how prosocial or antisocial they thought the embarrassed person was. Respondents viewed women as generally more prosocial, regardless of whether they were minimally or maximally embarrassed, than men, and in turn viewed men, regardless of their level of embarrassment, as more antisocial than women. Because embarrassment is a low-status emotion, researchers expected women to be seen as better people when they expressed shame. Perhaps because we tend to see women as less agentic, as having less control over their lives, and therefore less to blame and more prosocial when women disclose some embarrassing event in their own past. In other words, when girls do it, it's cute. When guys do it, it's cringe. Julian. In order to reduce some potential bias introduced in the differences in speech patterns used in the shameful story videos collected from subjects, a third study only utilized photos of people looking embarrassed by averting their gaze and holding a compressed smile or looking prideful with a wider smile and an upturned head. Participants in this study reported how prosocial, trustworthy, and moral they thought the photographed person was, and how much he or she might want to interact with the photographed person. Respondents felt that the embarrassed person was more prosocial and had a greater desire to affiliate themselves with that person. Moreover, desire for affiliation was mediated through perceived prosociality in that the more trustworthy or moral an embarrassed person was seen as being, the more likely respondents were to say that they would want to hang out with that person. In a fourth experiment, these same stimuli were used, but this time, rather than choosing to associate with the photographed person, participants were told the photos were of other participants in the experiment and played the dictator game again with the person in the photo as the receiver and themselves as the sender, allocating 10 raffle tickets for a chance to win $50 between themselves and the stranger. While subjects gave more tickets to the embarrassed person in general, this relationship was strongly mediated by perceived prosociality. That is, embarrassed people were seen as more prosocial, and the more prosocial they were seen as, the more raffle tickets that embarrassed person was allocated. A final study in this set sought to delineate embarrassment from shame, and while I've used the terms mostly interchangeably up to this point, they are a little bit different. And to illustrate the difference, in the first segment of this experiment, subjects were placed in a room with a confederate purported to be another experimental subject. 
The researchers entered the room and explained that the participant would take some opinion task with no right or wrong answers, while the confederate, the other person in the room, would complete a set of example questions from the graduate record exam, or GRE, which is a standardized test required for admittance into master's and doctoral programs, contains complex math and reading questions, and is generally a real pain. After completing the tasks, the experimenter returned and excitedly congratulated the confederate on a perfect score, something no other participant had ever done. To separate embarrassment from shame, in the embarrassment condition, the confederate averted her gaze, shook her head, or nervously touched her face in response to this news. While in contrast, in the pride condition, the confederate raised her arms, smiled, and raised her head upward, and in the neutral condition, she gave little to no emotional response. Participants' compassion and sympathy towards the confederate were measured, and then the two played a modified and computerized trust game and version of the prisoner's dilemma game, deciding how to divvy up 10 raffle tickets, wherein each ticket given to the opponent would be doubled by the researcher. Subjects gave more tickets and resources to the confederate when she looked embarrassed, compared to when she looked neutral or prideful in response to her getting a high score. Further, the tendency to give more to the embarrassed person may not have only indicated perceptions of weakness, but also a perception of humility. While we can cringe at the embarrassment of others, we also feel pity for them and may see them as better people or just good people in a bad situation without information to the contrary. Since cringe is context dependent, is everyone equally susceptible to vicarious embarrassment then? A study of correlates to empathetic embarrassment from Usul et al. 2014 developed a measurement of vicarious embarrassment and tested it against various personality variables. They found that experience of empathetic embarrassment was related positively to susceptibility to embarrassment, empathy, perspective taking, fear of negative evaluations, and negatively was related to self-esteem. A second study provided participants with an example of something embarrassing, in this case a video of a contestant on X Factor Bulgaria, specifically this clip. Responses were a bit different when it involved a media figure, namely in that vicarious embarrassment was unrelated to perspective taking, indicating that while we can empathize with regular people, particularly those that we know and like, and we can understand those people's embarrassment, we struggle with understanding the perspective of someone who is in even a minor position of fame or fortune. While embarrassment is a social emotion itself, Vicarious embarrassment is reliant upon socialization to even exist, as it depends on empathizing with the emotions of others. And as such, often we don't want to be helpful or associated with people who have been embarrassed and instead want to differentiate ourselves from a cringy or embarrassed person. But why? Could it be because cringe is physically painful? Well, to find out, let's look into the neuropsychology of cringe. When our friends do something embarrassing, we are more likely to feel embarrassed for them and with them, indicating that the pain of our friends or people similar to us can be our pain when that pain arises from social awkwardness. But this pain is not just some minor passing thing, it's something we can actually see within brain activity because social pain, as it turns out, is something we feel just like we feel physical pain. Mueller Pinsler et al. 2015 sought to understand the relationship between social empathetic embarrassment and brain activity to further understand why the cringe of others so often makes us cringe as well. Subjects were shown images and descriptions of two scenarios while their brain activity was measured via fMRI. The embarrassing scenario depicted a woman at a grocery store counter who was unable to pay for her purchase, and the woman was described either as the participant's friend or as a stranger. Well, in the neutral scenario, the woman, once again described as a friend or a stranger, returned some books to the library. After each scenario, respondents were asked to think about how much vicarious embarrassment these scenes elicited. The researchers found increased activation in various parts of the brain during the embarrassing condition in regards to both friends and strangers. This activation increased significantly in the anterior cingulate cortex, a region associated with ethics, morality, and emotions, the left anterior insula, a region associated with empathy, the medial prefrontal cortex, a region associated with conflict monitoring and emotional information, the brainstem, which regulates autonomic functions such as breathing and heart rate, and the right temporal pole, a region associated with emotions and socially relevant memory. 
As we can see right away then here, watching anyone else be embarrassed stimulates the part of our brains related to social emotions as well as basic brain functions like heart rate. Moreover, there was increased activation in the anterior cingulate cortex and left anterior insula when the embarrassing actor was described as a friend rather than a stranger. Once again, these two regions are associated with ethics, morality, emotion, and empathy, respectively. Thus, we might expect damage to these regions to inhibit the ability to feel cringe, but may also be a key component in developing skills necessary for high-level Arcana Hearts gameplay. Further, there was more activation in the Precuneus, a region associated with self-reflection for friends than there was for strangers, an increased connectivity between the Precuneus and the anterior cingulate cortex, illustrating that the part of our brain related to personal reflection communicates with the part of our brain related to morality and emotion, specifically when we see our friends being ashamed. Can you totally see through her shirt? Like an x-ray. <laughs> Because empathy, which we just saw, is related to activation in the left anterior insula, and we know is related to feelings of vicarious embarrassment, Crocodile 2011 sought to further understand the relationship between empathy and embarrassment in the brain. As with previous experiments, subjects were asked to imagine themselves as a person doing something embarrassing, but the intentionality and awareness of each event differed. For example, an aware but accidental embarrassing event would be falling and slipping in the mud, an accidental but unaware event would be walking around with one's fly open or with toilet paper stuck to the bottom of one's shoe. An intentional and aware event would be belching at a high-end restaurant, and an intentional but unaware event would be wearing a t-shirt with some kind of self-aggrandizing statement on it, such as, I am sexy. My mother didn't put a shirt on me that said, <laughs> the birthday boy. <laughs> Subjects rated how embarrassing each of these acts were from a first-person perspective or from the perspective of another person, and were asked how likely they were to feel with another person, being more emotional and empathetic, or how likely they were to take the perspective of another person, processing information more cognitively, thinking about the things as if they were happening to themselves. Interestingly, embarrassment was experienced more strongly when thinking about something shameful happening to another person than happening to the self, for all but one type. The most embarrassing type of event, both personally and vicariously, was accidental and aware type. Again, something like spilling a glass of red wine on your shirt at a restaurant. Outside of the aware and accidental, respondents felt more embarrassed when asked to think about others than when asked to think about him or herself in every case. Feeling embarrassment for another person vicariously was related to people who report being empathetic, emotional, and cognitive, while feeling embarrassment for the self was primarily only related to those who tended to be more cognitive and less emotional or empathetic. A second study utilized the same types of events as those presented in the first experiment, which were illustrated and then shown to participants along with descriptions of these events, this time while their reactions were measured via fMRI. Example scenarios included aware and accidental, seeing someone rip their pants while bending down, unaware and accidental, seeing someone wear their pants in such a way that their underwear is visible, aware and intentional, seeing someone talking on their phone in a movie theater, aware and unintentional, seeing a pedestrian on the street wearing a VIP necklace, and the neutral condition, seeing a woman checking out a book from a library. All types of vicarious embarrassment were related to increased activation in the anterior cingulate cortex and the left anterior insula, which we know, again, are related to ethics, morality, emotion, and empathy. The greatest activation in both the ACC and the left anterior insula was in response to the accidental and aware scenario, wherein subjects thought about someone ripping their pants in public, for example. Additionally, increased activations were noted in the thalamus, the preaqueductal gray, the brainstem, and the cerebellum, all structures that have been associated with empathetic perceptions of pain in others. Activation in both the ACC and the left anterior insula were consistently related to cognitive perceptions, while the relationship to emotional and empathetic perceptions were less consistent, indicating that we understand quite logically why something is embarrassing, and recognition of something being embarrassing is related to greater neural activation. Vicarious embarrassment is not something that we just feel for others, it's something that we understand cogently. In our daily lives, we're probably far less likely to come across someone doing something cringy or embarrassing in public than we are online or through other forms of media, and there's perhaps no larger intercultural cringe phenomenon than reality television, which was assessed via fMRI analysis by Melkers et al. 2015. 
Subjects first watched a short clip from a German reality TV program. They didn't specify which, wherein something embarrassing happened to someone. So because they didn't specify, I'm going to use Klaus the forklift driver. This embarrassing scene was compared to a neutral control scene, and then subjects were placed into an fMRI machine and shown stills from the program they had just watched. Participants experienced more compassion for the protagonists of the scenes when some embarrassing event occurred. Amusement was not related to either vicarious embarrassment nor compassion. The researchers noted greater activation during the vicarious embarrassment scene than the control scene in the bilateral middle temporal gyrus, the bilateral supermarginal gyrus, the right inferior frontal gyrus, and the left gyrus rectus. The middle temporal gyrus has been associated with the need to take the perspective of another person and the processing of social rejection. The supermarginal gyrus has been related to reduced emotional egocentricity and to enhanced perspective taking. Other research has illustrated that the supermarginal gyrus may explain differences in perceptions of the pain of others, indicating once again involvement in the process of perspective taking. The inferior frontal gyrus is involved in emotional empathy, cognitive empathy, and self-reported feelings of compassion. Finally, the left gyrus rectus has similarly been related to subject's ability for emotional perspective taking. Thus, the vicarious embarrassment that we feel when someone is doing something cringy on television is related to activation in the parts of our brains that are themselves related to being empathetic, feeling compassion, and understanding the perspectives of others. A similar experiment regarding German reality television programs, specifically the shows Germany's Next Top Model and Farmer Wants a Wife, which I've never heard of, but I would imagine looks something like this. Hey, I'm Plague of Gripes and watching WrestleMania. Now get the hell off my property. Was conducted by Heinen and Melcher 2014, this time assessing differences in the brain's gray and white matter volumes, the size and shape of the brain, in response to embarrassing situations. Gray matter is distinguished from white matter in that gray matter contains cell bodies, dendrites, axon terminals, and is where the brain's synapses are, while white matter helps connect gray matter areas to one another. Subjects watch short clips from these programs while being monitored by fMRI. Highly empathetic individuals exhibited decreased white matter volumes in the posterior cingulate cortex, the rolandic opicularum, the precuneus, and the insula, while in contrast, individuals who rated the clips as more amusing and hilarious presented with increased gray and white matter volumes in the inferior frontal and rolandic opicularum, the medial cingulate cortex, the insula, and the paracentral lobule. These results are indicative that more empathetic people have smaller white matter volumes in the brain regions associated with empathy, processing of emotional cues, and social pain. That is, people who are less empathetic may have brain structures that simply require more time to process the pain associated with embarrassment, while this connectivity is more direct in more empathetic people. Put simply, the brains of more empathetic and less empathetic people are potentially just a little bit different, and as such, the way we all respond to embarrassing events differs. Since empathetic embarrassment is feeling embarrassment for someone else, how do different perspectives, either taking the role of an embarrassed person or imagining ourselves as an embarrassed person, affect our neurological processing? For answers, we can look to Mayer et al. 2020, who used fMRI to assess activation during egotistical perspective taking and allocentrism in reaction to embarrassing events wherein an embarrassed person is aware or unaware of the shameful action. Allocentrism is focusing on the emotions of someone else. As with previous studies we've looked at, participants were shown a series of images accompanied by a description that depicted someone doing something embarrassing in public, in which that person was either aware or unaware of the reactions that others would have to this behavior, as well as neutral images of social situations. For example, an unaware embarrassing event would include someone having bad breath, falling asleep and drooling on themselves during a train ride, or having spinach stuck in their teeth, while an aware embarrassing event would include someone walking into a light pole, tripping and dropping a tray of food at the cafeteria, or forgetting one speech during a presentation. Participants were the most embarrassed when thinking about the feelings of another person rather than taking their perspective, when that person was aware of the embarrassing event, such as tripping and spilling their tray in the cafeteria. Generally, reports of embarrassment were lower when the person involved in the shameful event was unaware of what was happening, such as having spinach stuck in their teeth, 
But in these cases, embarrassment was stronger, and those asked to imagine themselves as the embarrassed but unaware person, indicating we are most embarrassed when we don't know that we're doing something embarrassing at the time. I wouldn't mind kissing that man between the cheeks, so to speak. And he realizes there is something distinct about the way he speaks. Tobias, you blow hard. Moreover, more empathy was reported when thinking about another person rather than thinking about the self in an awkward situation. In terms of neural activation, similar levels of activity were recorded in the media prefrontal cortex, whether subjects were asked to be allocentric, again, thinking about the emotions of others, or egocentric when processing these events. The medial prefrontal cortex has been associated with perceptions of negative evaluations by others and thus is central to both firsthand and vicarious experiences of embarrassment. Differences in activation were similar but not identical in other regions as well, including the anterior insula, which was slightly more active when being allocentric rather than egocentric. The anterior insula has been related to social exclusion, including heartaches after the breakup of a romantic relationship. In contrast, there was slightly more egocentric activation in the anterior cingulate cortex, which as previously mentioned is a region associated with ethics, morality, and emotion. These results indicate that we recognize things are more unfair when they happen to us, but still don't quite understand the pain of social judgment and social exclusion when it happens to others. There was greater activation in the left and right parietal lobules when the embarrassment was shared by the observer and the actor, both aware that the embarrassing event was occurring. The inferior parietal lobule bilaterally has been related to bodily pain, thus embarrassment both on the part of ourselves but seemingly particularly on the part of others is processed by the same part of our brain that processes physical pain and suffering. Cringe is painful, not just psychologically, not just emotionally, but physically. When the world star guy is freaked the f out, there's a problem. Whew. Well, if you guys made it through all of that neuropsychology, congratulations. And while we're not quite done yet, let's expand to further understand the physiological impact of cringe on the human body, starting with some research on something viewers of my channel may be very sick of hearing me say. And that's schadenfreude the German term for enjoyment at the embarrassment of others, contrasted now with the shame felt at the embarrassment of others, which also, as all good things, has its own unique German word, Fremscham, and we can learn more about it in a study from Paulus et al. 2018. The same stimuli that we've seen in this video over and over again were used in this study, images and short descriptions and the response to which were measured via fMRI, but this time the researchers were looking at the enjoyment associated with embarrassment of others versus the shame associated with embarrassment of others. The researchers found increased activation in the left anterior insula in response to instances of Fremscham compared to instances of Schadenfreude in response to the experiences of others. Again, the left anterior insula is a region related to empathy, so as we might expect, feeling pain or shame at the suffering of others is related to the part of the brain associated with empathy, while feelings of joy at the suffering of others is to a far lesser degree. Similarly, self-reported feelings in response to the embarrassing stimuli presented with greater activation in the left anterior insula in response to Fremscham over Schadenfreude. In contrast, activation of the left nucleus acumens was noted in cases of Schadenfreude but not in cases of Fremscham. The nucleus acumens in general is the reward center of the brain, indicating that while Schadenfreude may feel rewarding, Fremscham is not. Once again, seeing someone else being embarrassed when we feel that pain with them is not particularly enjoyable, but rather is processed quite similarly to physical pain. Going outside of the brain, Harris 2001 examined cardiovascular responses to embarrassment in a social setting. Participants were attached to a blood pressure monitor and asked to sing the Star Spangled Banner alone in the room while being recorded. Subjects then had 10 minutes to relax and an additional 5 minutes to take an unrelated survey to establish their relaxed heart rate. Then, the researcher entered the room, accompanied by two research assistant confederates, and played back the recording of the subject singing the Star Spangled Banner on a television in the room. The researcher and their assistants sat in the middle of the room between the subject and the television so that their faces could be clearly seen by the participant, towards whom they glanced and smiled during the screening. Truly only a mad scientist would do something so cruel. Why would you do that? Because I can. 
Afterwards, participants answered questions about how embarrassed, anxious, happy, fearful, amused, nervous, and angry he or she felt during this experience. They found that systolic blood pressure, that is, the pressure that the heart exerts while beating, and diastolic blood pressure, that is, arterial pressure in between heartbeats, were both elevated when participants were being embarrassed, being forced to watch themselves singing in front of smiling researchers' strangers. Blood pressure remained slightly elevated compared to the control period for five minutes after the embarrassing event. Heart rate spiked massively while watching the tape, but then dropped far below the baseline and suddenly began to creep back towards normal over the five-minute period. 43% of subjects described the situation as embarrassing, with the second most common descriptor being funny or amusing, and physiological data drawn from people who specifically described the interaction as embarrassing were similar to those who did not use the term embarrassing or a similar word like awkward to describe the situation. Even if we don't recognize an event as specifically embarrassing, uncomfortable social situations seemingly cause an increase in heart rate and blood pressure regardless. In a second study, the researchers sought to understand the potential effects of emotional suppression. The experiment was identical to that conducted in the first study, but this time some participants were specifically told to maintain a neutral facial expression while watching the recordings of themselves singing in front of the researcher and their confederates. Faces of subjects were recorded during the event along with their cardiovascular activity. They found that subjects asked to suppress their emotions had even higher systolic and diastolic blood pressure during and after the embarrassing situation than those not asked to suppress their emotions. The basal heart rate of those suppressing their emotions was lower than those not suppressing. However, as soon as the embarrassing event began, those attempting to hide their feelings immediately experienced a huge spike in heart rate that far surpassed those not suppressing and maintained more beats per minute up to five minutes after the event than those not suppressing their emotions. Those asked to suppress emotions had longer shifts in gaze, more smile control for longer periods, fewer smiles and face touches, fewer blinks, and they swallowed more. Thus, while on the outside it might be difficult to detect that someone is intentionally trying not to show emotions, their blood pressure and heart rate betray the true uncomfortableness of an embarrassing social interaction. Thus, it's not just your brain that processes shame or embarrassment similarly to pain. Embarrassing situations make our hearts beat faster and cause our blood pressure to skyrocket, remaining elevated even after the embarrassing event is over, which in tandem is related to increased galvanic skin response, illustrating the very real physiological and psychological and emotional effects of cringe. And because we know we feel cringe vicariously, this increased cardiovascular activity is not just likely to occur when we are embarrassed, but when we see someone else being embarrassed as well. So is everyone as likely to feel cringe all of the time, or are only some of us uniquely susceptible to cringe psychologically or physiologically? Muller Pinsler et al. 2015 found that the degree of embarrassment we experience is related to social anxiety. Subjects in this experiment were placed in a room with three confederates and took a quick intelligence test. Soon after, a researcher announced that the participant had the highest IQ out of the group and as such was selected for further testing via fMRI. While within the machine, respondents answered more questions purportedly designed to measure their intelligence. While this testing occurred, some were told that the other three test takers were observing the progress, while others merely saw photos of the other test takers but were told they were not watching, and the eye movements of the subjects were monitored during the test. Some subjects saw that they scored poorly, performing better than only 5 to 15 percent of the population, while others heard that they scored better than 40 to 60 percent of the population, a mediocre score, and some saw that they scored better than 85 to 99 percent of the population, an obviously quite high score. Afterwards, subjects were returned to the room with the confederate and answered a questionnaire about his or her feelings of embarrassment, pride, or anxiety. Participants reported greater embarrassment when they performed at an average or below average level. Moreover, embarrassment was by far the most prominent emotion when subjects performed better than only 5 or 15 percent of the population. Subjects reported more embarrassment, particularly in the low performance condition, when their performance was public rather than private. However, pride was not influenced by publicity whatsoever. Pupil dilation was greater when participants thought others were watching their actions, particularly when they performed poorly and was related to greater activation in the right insula, a region associated with sympathetic social arousal. When the test was public, greater activation was reported in the medial prefrontal cortex and the precuneus, regions associated with mentalizing. 
indicating subjects were thinking about how others might have been reacting to their responses. Variation in the amount of time spent gazing at the faces of others was related to greater activation in the fusiform gyrus, a region related to comprehension of facial expressions, indicating subjects were perhaps looking for some kind of emotional feedback from the photos on the screen. Moreover, gazing mediated the relationship between neural activation of the medial prefrontal cortex and precuneus and reports of social anxiety. That is, the more socially anxious people reported themselves to be, the more time they spent looking at the faces of other people on the screen, and subsequently, the more concerned they were about how others might react to their poor performance. Taken altogether, these complicated data indicate that people who are more socially anxious are also more aware of judgments from others when they are doing something embarrassing. Four leaf clover, make a wish. Wish you weren't so uh. awkward, bud. So, if cringe is physically painful, increases sweating, and raises our blood pressure, is there anything that makes the potentially nasty side effects of cringe any better, since social anxiety only seems to make it worse? Well, perhaps, as with so many things, we can look to answers from the old cuddle bug that's so beloved of human hormones, oxytocin, as seen in data from Gang et al. 2018. Oxytocin is a hormone produced during skin-to-skin -skin contact and is related to human pair bonding, including both romantic and parental relationships. Some subjects in this study were given an intranasal snort of oxytocin and then shown images of embarrassing everyday situations, similar to the stuff we've seen before, while their reactions were measured via fMRI as well as skin conductive reactivity. They found that subjects reported more general embarrassment when they had been administered oxytocin. While you might think that means that people feeling physically close to others are more negatively affected by cringe, those given oxytocin reported with lower skin conductivity response, meaning being potentially less sweaty when thinking about something embarrassing happening. Subjects given oxytocin also experienced decreased activation in the right amygdala and the dorsal anterior insula. There was also a negative association between right amygdala activation and the degree of skin reactivity in those given oxytocin, while in those given a placebo, this relationship was positive. The dorsal anterior insula has been specifically associated with increased arousal during embarrassing social situations, and the right amygdala has been associated with negative emotions, including fear in other research. Thus, it seems that oxytocin may provide resilience against embarrassment. So if you're feeling particularly affected by some serious cringe, grab someone nearby you and rub your face all over them. That will probably create more personal embarrassment too, but you just might feel a little better for it. Or at least you will before the arrest. So with all of that in mind, and before the cops show up, let's come to some conclusions. Cringe is a powerful thing. It can make us laugh to see someone else being embarrassed, but it can also make us feel shame when that person is in some way associated with us, be they a friend or a member of the same social group, and that shame can cause physiological effects, from sweaty palms to increased blood pressure and heart rate, to activation of the regions of the brain associated with physical pain. Cringe hurts, but it's particularly likely to hurt when someone we know is being cringy. While we can sometimes enjoy someone being cringy, The Office wouldn't have been the most popular comedy show on television for years if that wasn't the case, many of us feel not just psychologically uncomfortable, but physiologically uncomfortable when watching someone like Michael Scott parade around his utter lack of self-awareness. As a social emotion, we luckily developed this reaction to prevent ourselves from doing something cringy, knowing just how bad it makes us feel to see someone else doing them. Thus, while vicarious embarrassment often makes us feel awkward, it exists to discourage cringy behavior in ourselves, or at least I would surmise. Maybe our brains just evolved to be averse towards cringe. But hey, what do you guys think? Does seeing someone doing something embarrassing make you laugh, or does it make you cringe and feel uncomfortable? When someone you know is making a fool of themselves in public, do you stop to intervene, or do you avert your gaze and perhaps pretend you don't know that person? Let me know what you guys think about the concept of cringe in the comments down below. If you liked this video, please consider subscribing and sharing it with your friends, cringy or otherwise. I want to give an enormous thank you to all of my absolutely wonderful supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar. You guys are amazing, YouTube has been suppressing my channel for a while now, and I really, really appreciate your ongoing support. If you want to help out the channel, you can go ahead down to the link below and check out Coursera. You can support me on the aforementioned platforms or buy some merch from my merch store. Thank you guys so much for watching. Again, your continued support means so much to me, despite how cringy it may sound. Take care, and as always, dear friends, Altana Volt.
Just posted cream. 